we can start and everybody's gonna who's gonna be updating and all the rest of it um we'll do so as we go through introductions um i will just do as usual go through my hollywood squares um set up here and call on people and if you would just introduce yourself that would be great the only other thing i want to say is as i almost always do i want to switch around a couple things in the agenda i want to move from the introductions to the approval of the minutes and then i want to go to the announcements because they're going to be kind of big tonight and then we'll go into the short presentations on the work of the subcommittees okay so uh aaron you first okay hi everybody um as i mentioned at the tip top of this meeting unlike what my little square says i am not the vermont attorney general i am I simply work there. I'm Erin Jacobson, and I'm the co-director of our office's Community Justice Division. And I do have a cold. So if you see my camera off, it's just because I'm feeling self-conscious about blowing my nose 100 times. And I'm really happy to see you all here. I'm really glad we're reconvening. Um, happy New Year to everybody. OK. Um, Alexandra. Hello, everyone. My name is Alexandra Bailey. Um, please call me Alex. If I hear Alexandra, I hear my grandmother being mad at me. Sorry. <laughs> I, am, I am the senior campaign strategist at the Sentencing Project in Washington, D.C., and I'm very thrilled to be here to present today. Great. Grant. Hi, everybody. I'm Grant Taylor. I'm here as a minute taker for the panel. Which, by the way, keeps us all in line, just so you all know. <laughs> He's being very modest. Um, Dr. Reese. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Brashani. I'm really excited to be here tonight. If you hear noise in the background, I do apologize. I just came straight from a uh, state house in Rhode Island. So the work has begun up here in New England. I work with Alex actually at the Sentencing Project. I'm her community organizer, boots on the ground for the New England region. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Um, doctor or perhaps Mr. Singleton. Uh, definitely Mr. And actually, don't even say Mr. David is my okay. name. Okay. <laughs> I, I am with the Ohio Justice and Policy Center. I've uh, been in touch with um, Rebecca Turner of the Defender General's Office about um, second look work. But I'm really here to, to support and listen to what um, Alex is going to be presenting about later today because we're doing similar uh, work in Ohio, and I'm a huge fan of the Sentencing Project and a huge fan of the Defender General's Office. So I'm delighted to be here, and thanks for letting me listen in. Great. Thank you. Elizabeth, good to see you. Hey, Tom, good to see you too. Um, I'm Elizabeth Morris. I am the Juvenile Justice Coordinator um, in our Allison Services Unit in um, the Family Services Division of DCF. Great. Thank you. Jeff, who's not really in Wales. Uh, yes, Jeff Jones, um, I guess plank holder in RDAP and former state police and also member of the ACLU, which may some people may deem as rather odd, but I don't. Great. Thank you. Sing, good evening. Good, e good evening. Happy New Year. Uh, and to I'm you. Ting yeah, thank you. I'm Ting Ren. I'm uh, the evaluation and program analyst at Shelburne Farms. Um, I'm a community member on the panel. Great, thank you. Captain Kessler. Hi, um, I'm Captain Barbara Kessler with the Vermont State Police. I am co-director of the Fair and Impartial Policing Unit with, uh, along with Dr. Nasruddin Longo, who is my co-director. Jessica Brown. Hello, good evening. Happy New Year. Um, my name is Jessica Brown. I use she, her pronouns. 
I am a community member appointee to the RDAP, and I used to be a public defender most recently with the Vermont Defender General's Office, um, but for the past year and a half, I've been teaching criminal law related topics, working on justice reform and restorative justice at Vermont Law and Graduate School. Nice to see everyone. Great. Tyler. Good evening, everyone, and Happy New Year. My name is Tyler Allen. I'm the Adolescent Services Director over at um, uh, Department for Children and Families. I am the Commissioner-Designated Appointee to DCF. Great. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Representative Lalonde. Hello, Martin Lalonde, uh, and I'm a representative from South Burlington and uh, just started a new gig as the chair of the House Judiciary Committee. N nice to be here. Great. Thank you. Witchy. Hi, everyone. Name is Witchy. I don't feel like Quichy, but with a W, pronouns he, him, his. I'm also a community uh, representative um, appointed by um, Susanna Davis from the ex. Um, from the Racial Justice Department. <laughs> Words are not in my mouth. Um, I, uh, uh, as a day job, I'm a health equity and data systems consultant. Great. And speaking of, uh, Director Davis. Hi, good evening, Susanna Davis, Racial Equity Director. I am off camera for the moment because I am in transit to a place where then you will eventually see me. Great. Thank you. Um, Isaac from the Vermont Racial Justice Alliance, I'm believing. Hello, kings and queens. Yes, I think it gave my title away. Um, I'm the director of community engagement and support with the Vermont Racial Justice Alliance, and uh, I'm just happy to be here. Great. Thank you. Rebecca. Hi, everyone. Rebecca Turner from Defender General's Office. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, excellent. I'm having tech problems this morning. I mean, this afternoon, this evening. <laughs> oh, I tons of uh, tons of problems. Uh, oh. Panel member uh, from the Office of the Defender General. Okay. And I think we're on you, Tim. Uh, Tim Leaders Dumont in the Department of State's Attorneys and Sheriffs, and I'm the Legislative and Assistant Appellate Attorney in the Department. Hello, everyone. Hi. Hi. Um, Washington 2020, hashtag, hashtag. That's what I have in your square, ma'am. Oh, <laughs> hi, I'm Mary Morrissey. I'm Judge Mer Morrissey. Oh, God, okay. I, I don't know why it says that. I just, I was having trouble joining the link um, and I just barely, I was on Teams, not realizing I was on Teams and had to switch over. I couldn't figure out why I couldn't see any of the people you were calling out. Um, <laughs> But anyway, sorry. My name's Mary Morrissey. I'm a Superior Court judge. I don't know why it says I'm Washington 20 pound pound. Um, but I currently preside in Franklin County and I am, um, I guess, the judiciary's representative on this committee. Great. Sheila, hello. Mm. Hello, Aton. Happy New Year, everyone. My name is Sheila Linton. I use she, her pronouns, and I am an appointee by the Attorney General panel member, and my day job is Executive Director for the Root Social Justice Center, which is a nonprofit centering Blackness. Thank you. Haley Summer. Hi everyone, my name's Haley. I'm just a community member who lives in Burlington and I've been working with the sentencing project for a little over a year now. So I'm just here to support and learn more about Second Look. Great, thank you. Jay, Jay Green. Thank you very much. Um, Jay Green, uh, policy and research analyst for the Office of Racial Equity, I'm not an official panel member panel member, but I am um, uh, I support Executive Director Susanna Davis and all of our report writing and other research. So um, I'm here in case we discuss any research reports. Great. Thank you. Um, and I use they them pronouns. Thank you for having me. Got it. Chief Don Stevens. Hello, everybody. I'm Don Stevens. I'm chief of the Nolhegan Ebenaki tribe. I was appointed to the panel by TJ Donovan. And uh, yeah, welcome. Happy New Year. 
and to you. And last but not least, Reverend Mark Hughes from the Vermont Racial Justice Alliance. Happy New Year, everyone. Uh, it's, it's good to be here. Um, I just want to give a special shout out to Rebecca Turner and Sheila Linton uh, and, um, oh, who was it? Jeffrey, Jeffrey Jones, because you're the three uh, last standing uh, from the original panel. I uh, really appreciate y'all <laughs> hanging in there. Uh, I'm, I'm Reverend Mark Hughes. I'm the executive director of Vermont Racial Justice Alliance, Justice for All. Uh, we've also just spun out the Richard Kemp Center. Hi, Witchy. Uh, and um, yeah, just doing the work. We we created this panel uh, back in 2017 uh, under Act 54. Uh, and there's an accompany, a, comp a companion that goes with it. It's called the Attorney General's and the Human Rights Commission's Task Force uh, Report on, um, uh, I think, disparities across all systems of state government. Uh, which uh, actually led us into the work to create the Office of Racial Equity, or at that time it was called the Racial Equity Executive Director, which was Act 9 Special Session the following year. Uh, so I'm really happy to be here. We're going to stop in every now and then. We're going to keep an eye on what's going on. Oh, I'm also um, uh, infamous for the Minority Report, uh, the first report that was done by this uh, particular committee, which we won't talk about now, but uh, see me if you want to hear more. Um, Eitan, I appreciate you. It's good to be here, and I'm excited, uh, Martin, that you're in, at the chair of Judiciary. I'll talk to you. I'll be, be in the State House tomorrow, I think. Great. Thank you all. Okay, here we are. Let us get going. Um, I'd like to go to the, as I said earlier, to the approval of the minutes. They were sent out, as usual, with the agenda. Um, these were from our meeting in October. Uh, so I need to hear now about uh, corrections, addenda, such, um, so that we can get that tidied up and posted. Does anyone have any of those? I will... Um make a motion to move the, um, to approve, to move and approve the October minutes of the RDAP. Excellent. Anyone seconding that? I would second that. Good. Let us vote. All in favor, somehow I signify. Eitan, I think we should just, after that, I think we should just have discussion because I know that Jeff um, might have been raising his hand and that at that point there might be um, I corrections. Didn't see it. Or Thank you. No worries. Thank you. Thank you very much. Jeff, did you have something? A uh, small minor point, but I think sometimes really important, which is we should call for extension, abstentions as well. Um, sometimes yeah. that's important politically for people. We usually do. Is, is there something? Okay. Sometimes we miss that one, and I think it's important for some people politically on this panel or viewing this panel. That's all. Yeah. Small point. Small point. Um, anybody else? I, uh, Jeff, I think that's a good, great clarification, and I think that in terms of sort of like the um, legalese of it as well, I think that maybe for the minutes we need to note who made what um, vote, so at, at those who are voting panel members, so if somebody is abstaining or voting um, no, then I think that has to be reflected by name as well, um, correct me if I'm wrong, so I just for the person who's taking minutes, um, that might be useful too if we it is clear what who are voting panel members and who is making the decision votes and how that's going from approved to abstaining to no. Okay, just Thank you. so you know, Roberts does not always require names. A member can ask for that to happen, and then it can happen, but it is not just sort of assumed. Um, that's just just so you know how that goes. Um, but if you would like to record names and you want to do that going forward, we can do that. 
I say start in the new year off. I know that it's a little bit of extra work, but I think that whatever decisions we make as a panel, it should be reflective of who's, what positions um, people are holding within those decisions. Okay. Shall we vote then? All in favor of approving the minutes as submitted, please signify approval. Aye. 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 Grant, do you have that? Grant? I do and not not um i can i can sift through here i gotta scroll side to side to see all the different screens okay and it and it has and you have to have your camera on if i want to be able to see it so is it at all helpful if we write in the chat that we vote i or is that not helpful that might be the best way to do it right. um to do the vote in the chat. It, can everybody see the chat now that we're on Zoom? And the public can see the chat as well? I can see the chat. I, I, I wasn't able to before. I cannot see the chat, but I'm happy to, this is Tim, happy to signify if I, if I have some, um, some reason to note something. Okay. Okay. I just put my, yeah, there we are. Okay, can we keep going Grant? Cause that's in there. Yeah, I can get it from, I'll get the information from the chat. Okay, all opposed, please signify so. I know it's slow, but I'm leaving time for people to deal with the technology here. And okay, and finally, all abstentions, please signify in the chat. Okay, uh, the minute it, it if it has passed, in other words, the minutes are accepted as submitted. Thank you. That is done. Jeff, was that okay? Okay, good. Um, the announcement, I wanted to start by um, first off saying that we have, well, this sounds so dramatic. I should really figure out how to say this better. Monica Weber is no longer on RDAP. She has moved to a new position. She's the executive director of the Crime Research Group. So I imagine we will still be seeing her now and then. Um, and I have not yet heard of anyone who will be her replacement that is coming. Um, Aaron, have you heard anything of this? Okay, you neither. All right. So don't know where that's from yet, where it's going yet, but there will obviously be someone else from corrections. Um, and certainly by the next meeting, I think without a doubt. Um, that is, that's the big announcement. The other one is I wanted to give space to both Elizabeth and to Witchy, who were talking about what really feels to me like the next move that we need to make around this time, given that we have a report due in December of this year. Um, they were discussing, if you haven't been able to look at your email, the, the idea of putting together a um, spreadsheet with various initiatives and so on 
Um, and I don't want to hog the room right now because they were talking about it. And I'd like to just sort of turn it over to either of you to speak further about this. Go ahead, Witchy. It was your idea. I don't want to. <laughs> yeah, I'm happy to say my thoughts about it, but. Um, well, I'm just, uh, I guess the, what prompted this is like, as I was looking at this document, I was like, oh, well, this is all nice that we did all these things. But does, did something come of it? <laughs> right? So it's like, um, so I just thought it would be good for us to sort of revisit um, what have been our achievements. And in addition to that, where are they right now? Right? Were they implemented into policy? Were they, did someone pick it up somewhere else? Um, is there work that we still need to do with it? So just really thinking about um, sort of creating a feedback mechanism for ourselves in order to be able to really think about what work has been done, um, what has been its long-term effects, and do we need follow-up? And also, if there were good long-term impacts, what, uh, how did we have those long-term impacts and how can we use that, those strategies, tactics, um, or um, little points in it to be able to give ourselves more success. So that, thank you, thank you. So Elizabeth, there is a spreadsheet, don't you? Ha didn't I see one from you? Didn't, or I'm hallucinating. If, if you did, it wasn't from me. Um, I I'm would hallucinating. Just add, <laughs> or, or, or perhaps it's from somebody else out there floating that, I, that I'm just not aware of. I, I think the one thing I would add to your comments, which is that document um, does include things that our DAP has done, but it also includes reports and recommendations that other entities have started or in the realm of racial justice. So I know in particular, if we're talking about the juvenile justice aspects that are in that document, um, which I'm hoping we can chat a little bit about later as well, is um, there's a lot that's going on across the state of Vermont regarding so many different aspects that our depth theoretically could be involved in. And if we create a spreadsheet, I see it as kind of two different columns almost. One would be like our depth specific work products, and then the other ones would be other entities work products that we want to keep track of, that we want to be involved in and know about um, and give our thoughts and opinions on, especially if there are things that end up um, going to the legislature or policy changes within state agencies, et cetera. So that's how I was kind of envisioning it, um, just knowing that both of those pieces of work are represented in that document, which I think Rebecca was the one who originally started and put together. And that's Rebecca, right. me if I'm wrong. That's right. All right. So the spreadsheet. I've been on medical leave, folks. Where is it right now? Does anyone know? Hi, oh. Rebecca. Hi, I can't find my, my raise the hand. <laughs> um, I think this is a, this is a um, project that Susanna, Jess Brown, and I produced as we came off of the data project. We're having trouble with your audio. Oh, shoot. I think, me? like, talk at that microphone. <laughs> I'm going to call in. When you okay. turned your head to your right, Rebecca, it got much clearer. All right. That's that clear. I have a mess of a, of a system today. I'm gonna I'm gonna leave this call and just call in on my call. I'm sorry, uh, but I think Erin can fill in because I think Erin has been keeping track of this report for us. So while Rebecca's calling in, the as far as I understand it, I don't recall a spreadsheet, but there was kind of a working list of um, RDAP initiatives. And I agree with Rebecca. My recollection was that that was something that Susanna and Jessica and Rebecca worked on together. Right. And if that's the document everyone is thinking of, then it is in our RDAP SharePoint. Um, and all RDAP members should have access to it. And 
the other understanding I had when that document was created was that it was envisioned to be a working document. Right. And so that we could all add to it, we could all modify it, it could serve kind of as a um, grounding point for where we've been and where we want to go. Now, I also know that that there's been a lot of monkeying with SharePoint, so people should be able to access it now. If not, let me know and we will do something. That's all I can say. <laughs> I mean, uh, honestly, my office has done pretty much everything it can. Right. We reached a point where there was just nothing, nothing more that than that we could do because we have to use certain tech platforms that also have security checks. And so uh, I can't, for example, administer a Google Docs and like right. share it on my on the AGO website. But SharePoint is an AGO hosted site, and you should all have access to it. And um, Ann Walker can help you figure out the logistics if if it's just a matter of logistics not working for you. So let us know if that works or not. Um, and we will go from there. Does that sound reasonable? I'm putting Ann Walker's email address in the chat right now, just in case you're having a technical issue and need to be in touch with someone else about, I mean, she's the one to talk to about the technical stuff. I'm obviously like not. So, um, but it would be good for me to know if there's a problem because some things I will have to do and she can't, which he. I think <laughs> my thought is, is like, I feel like a document like that, if it doesn't have an owner that's like responsible for either managing or delegating, it's just sort of gonna, or like bringing it back to RDAP, it's just gonna fall out, right? And just like it happened, we're kind of just gonna forget about it. So maybe so like if that's something that we want to use, then I think we have to like commit to it. Um, and if it's not something we're gonna commit to, then that's okay. But I think we need to actively make the decision and not passively be like, well, it's there if we want it. I don't know. Those those are just my thoughts. Okay. Um, my my two cents would be I think we need it because we're gonna need it when we get to the point of writing things down which is coming. <laughs> um, so I would at this point say to people, please see if you can access it, familiarize yourself with it, use it, and I will commit to making sure that it becomes part of these meetings. If necessary, I can, I should imagine, be able to excerpt it and mail it as an attachment. Um, and Elizabeth says she's on the SharePoint and she doesn't see the spreadsheet that's discussed. All right. Um, I don't recall it being a spreadsheet per se. Um, I'm gonna have to get into a different account to, to get into that SharePoint, but I'll double check and see if I can find the title. Thank you. Yeah, but if you could just tell me the title, I'm sure I can find it. I'll put it in the chat with a link. Okay. Jess. I just want to say that the um, document that I recall working on with Susanna and um, Rebecca was um, really like a summary of a lot of different initiatives taking place around the state. Mm -hmm. um, and not that that could not be a good starting point for whatever document we want to create. Um, but I just want to clarify, especially if people are looking for it in SharePoint, that that's what I recall it being. Okay. And I'm also going to say something that will uh, embarrass me, but maybe other people are thinking this too. If um, perhaps Aaron, you could re maybe you already said this, sorry, if I missed it, resend the SharePoint link, because I don't know if I saved it anywhere. So I could use a resend. 
Um, I did say I would do that precisely okay, for the reason that, <laughs> and here's where, here's where maybe we want to think about a different platform is if you don't have the link in front of you, or you don't have some kind of way of saving all these different links to all the different boards and panels and projects you're on, it can be really hard to dig those things up. So I appreciate that difficulty that that happens to me all the time where I find myself like digging through my inbox with search terms. Um, so yeah, that's me, but, um, it's, this is an ongoing issue, right? We've talked about a lot is how do we ensure access to all of the shared documents that we want to be able to work on together. And we have been working on it. So, <laughs> I mean, a lot. So if there are still problems, I certainly apologize, but please don't take that as evidence that no one has been listening to the concerns that have been expressed here. Elizabeth. No. Yeah, I just wanted to jump in and say, and I, I feel like I, I'm going to bring us back into a, to a, circle, a full circle here, but um, Jessica, you just mentioning that the document that you worked on was kind of just a larger scope of everything that's working on. I think that's the document I sent, I resent to everybody last night in that right. case. Yeah, I think that that is, I think the document I sent is the document in question that everybody's remembering. So I think the ask that is to take that document and put it into a spreadsheet that is, and then assign people the duty of making sure it's updated continuously. That seems like that's kind of where we're landing. I seems so to me. Um, okay, so we need to turn that into a spreadsheet. That is another task. Aaron, can you and I talk about that later? Okay um that will happen that will happen thank you thank you all um anything else on this witchy oh no it, you've got a thumb up never mind sorry i get confused thumbs up hands up i don't know what's going on all right any other announcements that anyone has Aaron. Yes. <laughs> Sorry. I'm typing in the chat about the name of this document, which now I can just tell you since I'm talking. Um, it is, if you look in the RDAP SharePoint and you go to RDAP 2022-2023, look for a document titled Compilation of Reports and Recommendations. There's really not that many documents in the RDAP 22-23 right. folder, so you should be able to find it. Um, yeah. One thing I had asked Aton if I could have a little time um, this evening to just throw out there is that um, if you haven't already heard, um, the Vermont Judiciary's DEI Commission is engaging in some work to solicit community engagement around how the judiciary is doing on um, DEI issues. And I would... Um, also, just so you know, other RDAP members besides myself who are um, have been appointed to this commission are Rebecca Turner and Susanna Davis. And I hope I'm not missing anybody, but please interrupt if I did miss somebody. Um, but in terms of the community engagement panels, there have been just two. The first one was in Burlington. The second one was in Winooski. And um, the judiciary is definitely looking to improve the, the process, to improve the community engagement aspect of it, and to try to ensure that um, the, the community really feels like this is something that they can engage in. Um, and it's, it's a work in progress. Um, the judiciary has, folks I've talked to there have acknowledged that um, they want to do better, and they're really looking for ways to improve um, the outreach and the engagement. So just wanted you all to know about this effort. The next one, the next forum is at 4 o'clock on Thursday, J uh, January 19th. It is in Bennington at the courthouse. It is also on WebEx, and you can request a link through the judiciary's DEI Commission webpage, which I will put in the chat. 
Um, if anyone knows of any good contacts for the judiciary to reach out to, please let me know and I can pass that along. Perhaps they already have, but I just thought this could be a great group to ask for names of folks in the Bennington area that we make sure we, we let them know about this forum. And then the last little piece of the community engagement is that there is on this same webpage that I will provide a link to um, a place where you can submit comments and those can be anonymous. So even though the boxes for where you submit comments, like ask for a name, maybe even like an email or some other um, identifying info, you don't have to submit all of that information in order to submit a comment. So if you have any thoughts or feedback or ideas that you wanna share, with the Judiciary DEI Commission, please, please do so. We we really so welcome that. Um, that's all. Thanks. Okay. Um, I would like us to move into the relatively quick recaps of the work of our subcommittees. Um, please, I it's 1840 right now. Well, roughly, meaning it's 20 minutes to seven. Um, if we could do this within 20 minutes, that would be great. And that leaves an hour for Alex um, and for her presentation and for um, question the answer uh, time. So I'd like to start with the juvenile justice people, even though I know what they're going to say. <laughs> so either Tyler or Elizabeth, go ahead. I'm going to invite Elizabeth to go ahead and, and, and say what you know she's going to say. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. And I will try to keep this super quick, too. Um, and, and I think perhaps maybe this will be a little bit more of homework. Um, I, I hate to I hate to say that, but sometimes I think that's the best way to do to do this. Right. So and to go back to the document that we just went around in a circle on, um, you know, over the summer, for those of you that um, were with us, I did a, a pretty broad, I think I spent a couple hours over the course of two different meetings going into a lot of different work that's going on in different, uh, in different realms and organizations and state advisory groups, et cetera, across the state of Vermont about juvenile justice. And we never had a chance to really debrief and have a conversation about within that realm of work, what RDAP wants to get involved in, what our RDAP really specifically sees as their scope of work and what they want to jump into. So my main ask to this larger group is, what would you like um, our very small subcommittee of two, although I believe Rebecca has offered to, to join, so we'll be a subcommittee of three, um, to really dive into. Um, and the reality is, is that, it, you know, the juvenile justice world also branches into other aspects, right? You know, it has, it, it overlaps with our child welfare system, with our education system, with many other aspects. And that's represented in the document that I sent out last night. But what I would really like is to know what this group wants us to really focus on and what we should continue to work on. So that might mean reviewing that document and saying, oh, this is something that I really think that we should talk about, or, you know, this is something that I think another group is already working on and we don't need to add our two cents. Okay. I will also remind you, and I don't know if Rebecca has had a chance to hop back on yet, but um, Marshall Paul mm -hmm. did join us over the summer and he made a very direct pitch for us to focus specifically on um, youth who are in the adult system, right? So youth who are charged with the big 12 offenses. So that I do, I do wanna remind you all of that as well. He, he did specifically come to, to make sure that that opinion right. was raised. So that's my quick and dirty knowing we only have 20 minutes for however many subcommittees. Well, no, and that's good because you've just given us the homework. Um, and you've sent it out already, which, and this will go on the agenda, and Grant, you may listen in for this, um, this will go in um, on the agenda for our meeting in February. Um, in other words, look over that document and see what it is. I mean, and answer Elizabeth's question. 
basically. What is it in there that you as a member of this panel feel that this panel should take up in its report for December of 2023? Sound right, Elizabeth? That sounds absolutely perfect. And I, I will say, I don't know if this is the right time. I may or may not be at the next meeting. Um, I'm going on maternity leave the end of oh. February. Um, so it depends on when, <laughs> when, when, you know, when things happen, but I'm sure I, you know, I have full faith Tyler will be able to help in the stat and I'll be back um, in June. So great. And I may be here in February. And we'll congratulations. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so that was why I wanted to sort of say, you know, listen to what's going on here, to the, what Elizabeth, I knew she was going to say this, and I just, I knew there was going to be homework, and I wanted her to put that out there so that we can um, focus on that, knowing that that will be on the agenda next month. Uh, Tyler. Thank you, Aton, and I would just like to share that I am um, very happy for Elizabeth, and I'm very terrified what those months will bring, um, because I'm trying to imagine what work is going to be like without her there for a couple of months, and it's awful to think about. So we can put that <laughs> off the table now for discussion. I did also want to circle back to the to the spreadsheet that Elizabeth shared, to what we would like you all to like kind of look over, and just because I, I know there's some new faces in this in in this room that uh, haven't been around since the start of the conversation that generated this report, I want to make sure I, I I might be a little embarrassed to to kind of channel what I heard you saying a little bit ago, Jessica, about asking a question about the SharePoint link site. Um, just I want to make sure that I'm aligned with how everybody is thinking about how that report came to be. Um, and in my mind, it started with a conversation of what do we want to take on next as this group? And through that, you know, Rebecca, you, Jessica, a handful of you got together and said, well, we should just organize what is happening. And so all of that came to that first iteration of the report. And in that, we said, boy, something is really missing in here, and that's juvenile justice, yes. to which Elizabeth uh, and I, but mostly Elizabeth, put in all the, the what's in blue in that document that is talking about what is already happening with juvenile justice. So the reason I'm kind of rehashing that is how this quote-unquote report came to be as it is, is it's really designed in purpose for us to focus on what do we want to work on, and I'm bringing that up because while I'm interested in this group looking over the juvenile justice stuff and saying, what do you want us to work on? Um, it also doesn't have to be the juvenile justice stuff through the, the context of the RDAP. If we want to focus our energy on other adult things or, or, or the, you know, the adult side of the equation, I think that's fine. I, I, I bring it up because I want you to know that the efforts that are documented in there are going to be ongoing in their own way, in their own universe, regardless of whether the RDAP wants to have a role in moving that forward. And I think that's probably true of a lot of what's on the adult report as well. So pl please go through that and don't be like, well, that's important. We need to ride that too. We need to be on that too. We need to stay on form because I am... I, I, I do want to express caution for this group that we don't bite off far more than we can chew yep. By taking on everything all at once. So thank you for indulging me. Um, just wanted to make sure I was aligned with where everybody is at. Please correct me if I have it wrong in my head. Sounds about right to me. Um, uh, okay. Witchy, the community safety review, review, as it were. Yeah, excellent. So, um, Jay Green and folks from from CRG, we were all able to meet um, two times and sort of uh, uh, try to hash out what is really the scope of this work. Um, and I and we all came to the conclusion that it, it became a little bit difficult with me being the sole voting member from RDAP to really make a decision on where to go. Um, it, it, like we definitely have, you know, at least five five reports that we could review from around Vermont. Um, or so, or that uh, more or less that number. It might be a little bit less. Uh, but feeling like one CRG doesn't necessarily have the capacity for it, um, which means a lot of the work would fall on the uh, on J on J um, and and me. And feeling like 
that's not really the place where we want to be at this moment. So uh, I'm kind of like putting out the ask to back to RDAP. Are there actual voting members from RDAP who are willing to put in the work to read through these reports and or establish what the actual scope should be if we should only be looking at these reports or also reports around the country or in the New England region, et cetera, um, and, and bring back recommendations to RDAP. And if it's not something that we want to necessarily pick up right now, that's okay. But I think we do need to have a discussion here in RDAP of do we continue that subcommittee? And if so, um, are you willing to step up? And that's basically it, folks, because the voting members, that's pretty much directed at you, um, us. We need to either make a decision to do this or not at this point. Um, I would, what would you recommend, Witchy, that we have that discussion at our next meeting in February? Uh, I mean, I think something to to think about is that time is short, right? If we yes. want to establish scope and read through these numerous reports, we got to start working on it. Right. Um, so if it's okay with everyone, I'd rather it's just, it's oh, Siri decided to read um, what I'm saying. Um, so, I mean, I think we should make a decision today. If we don't feel like we have enough time to think about it, then, you know, sure, punt it off to February. But my feeling is the sooner we make a decision and start working or not, the better. Okay. Um, then let's do this fairly quickly. Are there people who feel that they can work on this committee who are voting members of the panel. Okay. And so I am taking this as a no. Well, I guess I would say, I mean, I would, I, I think it depends. It's it's a really loaded question. I mean, yes. when you say, do it, like, what's the time commitment? What it, what exactly work are you looking to have done? So I think maybe a little bit more information in terms of what the expectations would be would be helpful. Witchy, can you do that? Well, I I think my point is, um, you know, is do I necessarily have the authority to be an unpaid volunteer to come up with a scope for it? Right. What I'm asking is for people to come forward and be like, OK, communities did these, did these safety reviews. Should we look at them? If so, how should we approach it? Right. So what I'm asking is for people to decide what that scope is. Um, and I don't necessarily feel like it should be on me to decide that. OK, there are how many reports you have? Five? Yes. Uh, at most five. OK, can you give us a sense of how many how long they are roughly? Um, Mon, it's great. I will not rely on my memory. Can I take a look at them real quick and then get back to you within okay. a minute? Okay. Um, why don't we let you do that and we'll circle back to this after Alex's presentation. Does that make sense? Yep, that sounds good. Thank you. Okay. Um, and then I guess lastly here, would be the second look subcommittee, and that would be Rebecca. Um, and that would then move into um, Alex's presentation. Hi, can you hear me? We can. Oh, excellent. Yeah, I'll, I'll, okay, so I'll be fast. Um, so I think, well, second look committee has not met for at least a couple months. <laughs> sure. But when we last met, we landed on where we are at this moment, which was that we thought we we needed to hear from experts in this area uh, from around the country. And we decided as a group that rather than have these kinds of presentations lost on the entirety of the panel, we wanted to bring these people to the full panel at our monthly meetings to share what they know, so that we could get some uh, grounding um, 
as we launch and, and explore what we're interested in doing here in Vermont. And so, uh, Richie, I know you had a name. You, I think David Singleton said something in the chat, and we missed him. Um, but he is also someone who was identified as as one of those experts in this area. And of course, we have the two uh, wonderful people here tonight from Sentencing Project to share with us um, what they know. And so I think what where this committee is at is we expect to bring forward um, experts. We're hoping to have David Singleton actually come back and speak to, to us in, at another meeting. And Wichi, I know you had a name uh, that you were hoping we could um, have invited here. So I'll follow up with you. But so more to come, and if any of you have other names of people that we should be aware of, please send them my way, and we'll 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 figure out a way to to get them space to talk with us about this. And that's Great. all I have. Okay. Any questions or comments from anybody before we move ahead? Okay. No. Then. Uh, I guess I would say, Rebecca, would you like to introduce Alex? Sure. Um, Alex Bailey. And, and Alex is, um, did I see your colleague here as well? No, I can't find the Oh, that's right, Dr. Oh, yeah. Reese. Yes. Dr. Reese, yes. Hi, Dr. Reese. So I met these two uh, last year, um, <laughs> two, months, uh, two weeks ago, three weeks ago, uh, where um, I learned about their work and interest in um, second look legislation here in Vermont. Of course, this is a uh, sentencing project, folks. And um, oh, shoot, I'm sorry I didn't come prepared with a little background on the sentencing project. I'm a little embarrassed. But Alex, do you mind? I mean, this is what you were going to talk to us about. Uh, but certainly uh, experts in this field, along with more than just second look, but talking to us tonight, as I understand, specifically on second look. And because time is short, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Okay. And Alex, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Um, thank you all so much for, for giving me time here at your meeting. Um, I'm very honored to, to be in the company of people who are doing so much work for their state to make it better. Um, it's really a wonderful and unfortunately, in my experience, working in all 50 states, a refreshing thing to see um, where a group of people from all across the state, from all different backgrounds are coming together to really dig into what can be done concretely to make their state um, as equitable, um, as safe, um, and as anti-racist as possible. So um, that's really, really fantastic. So uh, as they said before, my name is Alex Bailey. I'm the senior campaign strategist at the Sentencing Project. I lead our campaign to end life imprisonment, meaning that I work in all 50 states um, to roll back mass incarceration. And in rolling back mass incarceration, that means you're rolling back a lot of things. Um, you're rolling back um, a history of sexism, you're rolling back a history of anti-LGBTQ, you're rolling back a, a history of every ism that you can think of, because that's what we've done with our mass carceral system. So for the last 30 years, the Sentencing Project has pretty much been at the vanguard of research and advocacy around our nation's mass carceral issues. Um, we have reports ranging from, obviously, Second Look um, through every single state. Um, we have uh, data, and I will actually put in the chat here for everyone. This is our report on Second Look, written by um, one of our, our, now one of our head of research, uh, Nazgul Gandnoush, which talks about why rolling back extreme sentencing, particularly at this point in history, is um, absolutely vital. And I'm joined by my colleague, Dr. Brashani Reese, um, who uh, is a restorative justice facilitator um, who has dedicated her life and work to ending mass incarceration um, and uh, always serves as a sort of a, a great North Star when it comes to the, uh, the brain science that, that goes behind uh, what it is that we do. So at the Sentencing Project, the vast majority of my portfolio now encompasses second look bills. What are second look bills? 
Second look bills allow a person after a fairly long term of incarceration to go back before a judge to determine whether or not continued punishment is necessary. If this person is deemed to be rehabilitated and is able to reenter the community safely, at that time, they will be able to do so. Now, every state has a different process when it comes to this. We are currently working um, in seven tier one states um, on repeals that are involved with Second Look. We are also mounting a Second Look legal network, which will be up and running this year. We hired the former head of the Innocence Network, which everybody, you know, the Innocence Project, they have branches all over um, the country. We hired their former head to basically talk to every legal agency in the country that does any type of post-conviction resentencing litigation. Everything from law school clinics to pro, uh, practices that take on pro bono work to individual attorneys to defenders offices that did resentencing. And that community of practice came together and helped us put together recommendations on what Second Look should do. So I dug into Vermont um, a little bit. We're, we're digging even further into the data, but at least as of seven o'clock this morning, you all had 1,348 people currently incarcerated in the state of Vermont. Um, you have a population that is 94% white, and I'm sure you all know this. And unfortunately, in terms of racial disparities, despite having a relatively small population uh, compared to many other states in the country, the racial inequities are, in my opinion, problematic, disturbing, large. Um, yeah, this hand gesture. I don't know how we quantify that statistic, but we'll go with that hand gesture. Good hand gesture, Jessica. The reason I am here very specifically, and I, I want to get into discussion um, about this um, because I hate not being able to see people's faces. I like to be able to interact since I can't be in a room with you all. Um, you're all here because you're concerned. And there are a lot of things that can be done on the front end to deal with racial inequity. My personal opinion is that unless we go all the way into the harm that has already been done and really learn from that history, go back through our system and reevaluate all of the cases that can be reevaluated under this banner, then that is actually a great starting point for us to start to figure out what went wrong. <laughs> a lot of times, the people who have come back on second look have been the best teachers and guidance on that research. Um, in Washington, D.C., where I live, we passed a second look bill. My fellow was a recipient of it. The several hundred people who've received second look resentencing in Washington, D.C., um, are now some of the primary leaders in our in our city around our around our carceral issues and in general. So I just want to stop there and say, is everybody sort of with me so far? So taking a look at Vermont's data, um, I have been so bold as to actually draft a bill um, to uh, present to you all. And I'm just going to drop a document here in the chat. It's going to make it a little bit easier for everybody to follow along because bills are annoying to read. <laughs> but I'm going to tell you, in essence, what we are proposing. Vermont, um, although you all have, have taken steps to reduce your overall carceral population since 2003, you've doubled your amount of people who are serving what the sentencing project would describe as extreme sentences. Um, sentences that would be um, virtual life or would take you into old age. As of today, 22.47% of your prison population is over the age of 50, which um, given how prison ages people is considered senior um, by these standards. The bill that we're proposing is that after 10 years of incarceration, you would be permitted to apply 
to see if continued incarceration was necessary in your case. We would ask that a multitude of things be taken into consideration. And they're fairly, I think for the people on this call, uh, fairly obvious things. Um, we would want the court to take um, into consideration whether somebody had medical conditions, um, major mental illness. Um, we basically use the federal standard on that in almost all of our bills. We would want um, them to obviously uh, review whether this person was under any sort of duress at the, the time, at, at the commission of their crime, the history and characteristics of the incarcerated person at the time of petition, obviously their age, and we want them to consider the age at which they went into prison. Um, unfortunately, um, Vermont, like many states, um, at what we now know about brain development is that people under the age of 26, or as my father says, 55 for men, um, <laughs> uh, don't have fully developed brains. Um, so a lot of the bills that have been passed have been based on this sort of new brain science that we have available to us. So we would ask for special consideration for people who were incarcerated under the age of 25. Um, and this is a practice that's already happening across the country after Miller. Um, and that age in many states is creeping up anyway. Um, in Michigan, one of the states we're working in, they're now considering people up to the age of 21 already based on this cognitive science. Um, we obviously want to take a look at the nature of the offense, including changing societal attitudes um, regarding those types of crimes. Um, the circumstances of the person's incarcerations, including their conditions of confinement, um, physical and sexual psychological abuse that they might have dealt with while they were incarcerated. Um, obviously, anything we know about their mental health, we want to take a look at effectiveness of counsel um, at the time um, of their sentencing. Um, and obviously, whether or not they were the victim of physical, sexual, psychological, or intimate partner household abuse uh, that in any way led to um, what became their criminalized behavior. And of course, we'll leave it open to the courts to anything else that they would feel they would deem necessary to consider. Um, in order to um, make this bill most effective, what we're saying is, is that everybody would have after 10 years of incarceration, mind you, for first degree, currently in Vermont, I believe, I know there are judges on this call, I believe it's 35 years is currently the minimum, and that could go up currently to life without the possibility of parole. Is that correct, Judge Morrissey? Well, it depends what degree of, of homicide you're talking about, but- First degree. First degree is, is a presumptive minimum of 35, correct. And then I believe second degree is um, a term of 20. not less than 20 years. Correct. Um, those are both extensive prison periods. So this bill does not guarantee release. I want to be very clear about that. Um, this is an opportunity for consideration to show rehabilitation for release. But it does allow the system to go back and review what has been done thus far. A good portion of your uh, currently incarcerated population, and I'm currently crunching the exact number, um, would be eligible to have their cases looked at. I think that this is very important because the people who've served a lot of the longest sentences in your state are predominantly black and brown people. And when we talk about changing societal attitudes, one of the things that we definitely have to consider is the overcriminalization of black and brown populations. Was that a hand judge, Morrissey? It is, thank you. Um, so I'm trying, I don't know if you, I think, I think you said that you had put a copy of the bill in the chat, but I don't see it. So- It's a Google doc. You should see a Google doc link, but I'll drop it again. Okay. If you and, on the link that's right there, you should be able to see it. Okay, great. Thank you. And so how does that, how does your bill, um, 
uh, address so, so many of the factors that you just went you just outlined are also uh, brought up at the original sentencing. So how does it work in other states in terms of recognizing that these issues were already addressed once at the time of sentencing? Well, I mean, the argument very much is is that very frequently they 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 haven't been. Um, we wouldn't have the the sort of racial disparities that we have. I mean, if if that were the case, like even uh, one of the cases I'm working on right now in Michigan is my friend Susan Brown. She got stabbed in her pregnant stomach. And in the ensuing struggle, she killed him. She's serving a life without parole sentence because at that time, the understanding of domestic violence was not what it is now. And it was not considered under judicial authority the way that it is now. So I guess my question is, it, under the second look legislation that you've been working on, are the issues that have to be brought up pursuant to second look something that did not get brought up at the original sentencing? No. No. Okay. They, so they, it's it's merely rehabilitation is is the is the opening reason about why the resentencing happens. However, one of the things that can be considered in the case is any aspect of the trial that was problematic. Okay. All right. Thank you. Is everybody with me so far? Does this all make sense? So, okay. Um, so this is, you know, very much a preliminary bill. I would very much like people's feedback about this, but this basically just expands judicial authority to go back through and take a look to see if the people who are currently incarcerated should continue to be incarcerated um, after they have served 10 years, which if anybody can think back to what they were doing and who they were 10 years ago, um, it, it is a significant portion of a person's life. Um, currently, um, as, as we pointed out, 35 years is the minimum under first degree, no less than 20 years is the minimum for second degree, um, which could essentially take somebody more or less to the end of their life um, effectively. And all that this bill really asks for is that people be reviewed at regular increments to ensure that continuing to, to have them incarcerated is the appropriate course of action. Dr. Reese? Oh, please call me Brashani, Alex. <laughs> Everybody, please call me Brashani. Um, if I could just add something. Foundationally, the purpose of Second Look is to address the public safety component. So when somebody is sentenced, um, there is this idea that um, at the time of the sentencing and from a forensic risk assessment perspective, that this individual is dangerous and that we have to keep them incarcerated for a really long time. And I think what Second Look wants us to, you know, wants to facilitate really is that we can't predict who a person is going to be 10, 20, 30, 40 years from now. And so at the time of the original sentencing, this person may have been deemed as, as you know, um, dangerous to society. And when we're looking at somebody later on, um, and again, from restorative justice, I'm wearing all the hats here, from a restorative justice facilitator perspective, that person may have had contact with their survivor, they may have gone through a process, there may have been forgiveness, there's a lot that has happened in, in 10 to 30, 50 years. Um, and so second look would allow somebody who would otherwise not ever have a judicial opportunity to go back before a judge, the opportunity to go back before a judge. And um, I would just add one thing before I, I answer um, hands. One of the major things that comes up in second look questions is how do survivors of crime feel about this resentencing? Um, we actually recently took part in a report that um, as I start answering questions, I will put into the chat, which was actually done of survivors of violent crime, their family members, if that person wasn't surviving, um, DAs, um, to discuss what it is exactly survivors actually want. And I can say personally, as a survivor of violent crime, on unfortunately more than one 
moment in my life um, that, you know, not everybody comes to the same conclusion. Um, in a lot of states that we're, we're in, um, a lot of times there is e even support from survivors or they said like, you know, I don't want to know anything about it. I leave this up to the court system. Sometimes they do want to be involved. Um, and we sort of allow that to play out. This is not a system that cuts sort of any aspect of this out. This is a full blown reconsideration. Um, after a decade or more that if this person can be readmitted to society. Uh, Jessica, I believe I saw your hand first and then I saw B. Kessler and then Jennifer. I actually think that um, Barb had your hand up first. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, so I, I'm with the state police and I did a, a time in um, detectives where we worked homicides and stuff. And I've been involved in some pretty nasty cases. And one of which this person is serving life in prison in Vermont, killed a 12 year old girl and did unspeakable things to her before she died. Um, I'm, I don't wanna get upset. <laughs> I, I totally agree with second look, um, but I think there should be people who are ineligible. Um, that person should never, ever get out. He got out because he raped someone. And then he got out and he told his rape victim that he was going to rape and kill a 12-year-old girl. And he did. And I don't want anyone to go through that ever again. Um, I know it will continue to happen in our society, but I think there should be um, consideration for not looking at certain cases and his would be one he is an evil evil human being without redemption um that's all <laughs> jessica thanks um i uh was going to ask this question and then brashani brought this up so um restorative justice is in increasingly kind of my, my area of interest um, and work. Um, and so I am wondering how, if and how restorative justice is ever incorporated either sort of formally in legis second look legislation or more informally, um, maybe not actually explicit in legislation, but like how it's considered if it's if if you're seeing any sort of trend of restorative justice processes um, being uh, considered in some of the second look legislation or the work around it. Thanks. So just to answer just from an, a pure legislative standpoint, and then I'll let Bershani put on her her hat as a facilitator. Um, what we have done, and the only thing that really can be done is to say in most states have a victim's bill of rights. Um, and in the victim's bill of rights, we have amended it to say that the person is entitled to restorative justice facilitation should upon notification, they decide that they want it. Um, so that becomes their choice. Um, and they can either opt out of the proceedings, they can say that they don't think that this person should be eligible for anything, or they can decide to engage in a restorative facilitation process. All of these options are open to them um, in every state that that we've proposed it. Um, and, you know, and I, I will say, uh, you know, just to, to the officer's point, um, you know, I survived a, a heinous rape as a nine year old. Um, you know, I have very much been through the pain and trauma that that causes. Um, and I have actually done a restorative process with my rapist, with the person who assaulted me, um, which was a major part of my healing and is a major proponent of why I now do what I do for a living. Um, watching and learning what he went through and why he did the things that he ultimately ended up doing was very eye-opening for me um, and really made me a huge proponent of giving people a second chance. Um, is it is it witchy? Is that how you say your name? Yep. <clears throat> An easy way to remember is like, Ouija. Like, having fun. I mean, first of all, that's the coolest name ever. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I'm named after a Puerto Rican painter. Um, yeah, so... 
I appreciate you sharing your story, Alex. Um, I, I guess, so uh, there's definitely like, a, so, a sort of like my own opinion and in, in the form of a question is like, um, in response to the, to the captain of like, yeah, that's a heinous crime and it's like awful to think about. And do we believe as an advisory group then that know that there are certain people who just don't deserve redemption and therefore like is it not a blanket right that everyone has a chance to re-examine their case right <laughs> sort of like the kind of ethical argument that we would need to discuss in order to to assert that kind of exemption um and in that case i i would also want to ask in this and i have two questions here um, the first one being, you know, if someone does get out because of the second look or has, you know, that 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 right to to rehabilitation, um, and they recommit um a, the the same type of crime, is there something in the bill for that? And then the second question, uh, which is unrelated, um, is that we've discussed a lot about like, you know, one of the opportunities of second look is that we can address past biases, right? Like thinking about the 90s versus to like 2020, right? And thinking about the, the biases that existed within our judicial system, especially specifically our judges. And we were debating of like, should it be a different judge? Do we open that to more biases? Like, is it okay if it happens to be the same judge? So wondering also if there's any language around that. Thank you. So um, that has worked differently in different states. So in a lot of states, judges have been uh, their carceral population is so elderly at this juncture that most of the judges who were benched at the time are no longer. Um, and other states have decided to ensure that that doesn't happen, that they want to, that you go before a sentencing judge, but it is not specifically your original sentencing judge. Um, it becomes a shuffle. Different states have made different decisions on that for that very reason, um, New York State being one of them, um, around their Domestic Violence Survivor Justice Act for the simple reason that watching the extreme sentencing that happens to women and those particular biases, that it was not appropriate, they felt, for them to go back before the same person. Um, so, I mean, that is something to discuss around the bill um, and how you sort of want to, to handle that or couch that. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. And in, in, in all of the states that, uh, in, including, well, my non-state, DC is not a state, we're a district, um, that uh, have second look or considering second look, they are not currently carving out offenses for the simple reason that in doing so nullifies the point of second look, which is to go back and look and review. You are not guaranteed to come home by any stretch of the imagination. Um, you are merely given an opportunity to plead your case. Um, and therefore they felt one, due to populations and what the offenses were, particularly around women and black and brown people over sentencing also becomes a concern, mm -hmm. historically speaking. So they did not want to carve out any offense types. Um, I don't, I'm sorry, I always lose track of whose hand was up first. I think you have Aaron at this point. Okay, thank you. And then you have Jennifer. Thank you. I'm not sure this is a question, but I just want to kind of call up a, a a thought that I'm having around the notion that, um, you know, I'm not the same person that I was 15, 20 years ago, but at the same time, and I know that, you know, we all know that's true with brain science and human development, but at the same time, also, I've not been incarcerated. I've had all the opportunities available to me to, you know, do realize my dreams, work on myself, you know, live a full and free life. And so I'm just wondering um, if, if second look legislation has facilitated conversations around 
or even maybe programming around actual rehabilitation inside of prisons because you know not all facilities provide the same kind of opportunities for real rehabilitation they're much more about punishment than reform and correction most facilities offer next to nothing, um, generally speaking, across the country. Um, you're lucky if you get a decent meal that won't cause you to have diabetes and hypertension. And uh, the average age of death for men is, I believe, 53 or 54 while incarcerated at this juncture. So if you go to prison, you're, you're going to die young, more than likely. Um, so the answer to your question is, is that I was recently, I, I traveled to facilities all across the country talking to lifers associations about this. And here's what we know about people who have served extreme sentences. One, they are the least likely to recidivate. And we've tracked this all across the country. Two, they are actually the most likely to engage in rehabilitative efforts. They usually become leaders, educators, um, you know, they're the one that take the young people under their wing when they come in. Um, I have friends who are currently incarcerated who are getting master's degrees from the Chicago Theological Seminary, who change their whole program to include them. So taking a look at extreme sentences and those folks, your recidivism rates are very low to also answer Witchy's question. But also when you put hope in front of people, there is now an incentive to take part in rehabilitation. But most carceral systems, um, and to my understanding, including Vermont's, do not really offer much rehabilitative anything to people who are serving extreme sentences because the, the accepted line on them is that they're gonna die there. Um, or, you know, given conditions, they will expire of natural causes before the end of their sentences. So, it, you know, this bill also opens up a driver for the state to do better in that regard. But even without that, I have met people who, and I am not taking away from some of the horrible things that were their initial offenses. Um, I'm very abundantly aware of some of the things that they've done. I've met with the people who've survived them. Um, and I can tell you that 20, 30 years on, you wouldn't know this person. They're a completely different person. Uh, Jen uh, Jennifer? Thank you for um, your um, bringing this forward. And I do have to do two disclaimers. I didn't was able, wasn't able to see the bill, and also I'm not a voting member of RDAP. I'm here by virtue of um, my being able to be included by um, my partners and allies. Um, I'm the director of the Vermont Center for Crime Victim Services, and this piece is really um, significant for us. And so I had a couple of different questions for you, and again, I want to thank you for the work that you've been doing. Um, one of the pieces that I had a question about was. If, and I think some of the members of this panel, if I, if I might speak, um, Dr. Nezra Logo, is that okay if I ask questions? Please. Okay. Um, if one of the pieces that we're here to think about is how we apply laws in a way that can mitigate disparate impact, how do we know that this is not going to result in additional uh, ramifications in terms of implicit bias? How do we know that this is actually going to change a culture when we haven't really gotten to that piece? And is it going to result in more, frankly, white people who have means being able to take advantage of these pieces versus, um, so that's one of the questions that I have, and I have other questions, but that's, is it going to result in more, or do we have data that says it will result in less? Because I don't know that Vermont has shifted, and I'm worried that when we think we're solving a problem, we're going to create a different one. So here's what I can tell you from other places that have implemented this. Um, the vast majority of people who are its recipient are black and brown. Now, the people who are privileged in any system 
without completely tearing this apart, which I do not pretend this bill does. Um, you know, this does not redistribute wealth in the state of Vermont or the country, right? You know, this does not redistribute privilege in the state of Vermont or the country. Will people with privilege be able to take advantage of it? Yeah, I'm sure they will. Will people who are black and brown over sentenced from impoverished communities get the first shot they've ever had at actually like being looked at, even though their their lives are essentially gone due to incarceration? Yeah, they'll get a chance too. Um, because right now, there's no chance of review for them, period. They're going to they're going to live their life. They're going to live the vast majority of their life there or they're going to die there. Um, and so. It, this will actually be an opportunity, the first opportunity that many of them will get, especially since you guys have a high proportion of people who went to prison under the age of 25. And I can also say as somebody whose family is from the South, my family is originally from Mississippi and Louisiana. Vermont sends a lot send some of its carceral population to our to, to our states and i can has anybody here visited a prison in mississippi or louisiana all right well here's what i'll tell you my loved one is currently incarcerated at angola i'm sure you've heard of it oh yeah um you don't come back from those prisons the same So being being offered this shot, I don't pretend that this undoes everything in the system, but I would argue that it is a vital initial step to go back and look at the history of sentencing in your state. Now for Vermont, that's a very different lift than a lot of the states that I'm working in. Like for example, in Michigan, their prison population is 36,000 as of this morning, they would have to review 10,000 cases, 5,000 lifers just to make a, a dent. Vermont has an opportunity to do this and to do this type of review with a lot fewer people. So I think that it, it will be a very good opening system, but also it'll be the first time that Vermont can actively track resentencings. You could actually start to put numbers to all of this in real time. Hmm. And one of the things that we've encouraged a lot of states to do is actually to put a research component as an accompaniment bill to the second look bill so that they can actually really start to look at in real time how what they've done historically, but also what's happening now. Does that make sense to you, Jennifer? So, I mean, yeah. Oh, absolutely. I think her research component's important. Um, I'm just without, and I, again, I apologize, without having seen the bill, I just know that various states do this in different ways in terms of who this applies to, who triggers it, these other pieces. And I want to make sure that, um, and I agree with you, that victims do want to be a part of mm -hmm. this part. Yeah. Whether it's because they don't agree with it, or maybe they do. And I think people assume that victims are uncomfortable with these conversations and they absolutely do want to be engaged, um, sometimes in a really supportive way for yeah. what the person has been working on. But I think that for me, it's working out the details and making sure that we're really transparent and clear in criteria. Um, I do think so that, 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 so yeah, for me, that's, you know, if, if one of the, pieces we're trying to solve. And we don't have a lot of people here in Vermont that serve life sentences. Um, you I, actually have a fair number of what we would consider, what the sentencing project would consider to be virtual lifers. So people actually sentenced to life without parole. No, that is a relatively low number. Um, people serving 20 years or more is a more significant number. But we have earned time now. We have presumptive parole. So that's shifting as we do a lot of great reform in Vermont. So I think that our presumptive lifers uh, are changing. And I think our mandated sentencing is also changing. So I'm just thinking about what it looks like for us here in Vermont and not trying to be obstructionist. And I, I will not speak anymore because I'm just here by the grace of the panel. But I think there are some pieces that are shifting here in Vermont. 
Um, and I think that, you know, the devil's in the details. And I do think that um, I want to understand what the end goal is, which is not to make anything um, exacerbate any of the things that we're seeing here in Vermont, which I agree with you that we are seeing those. And remember that victims um, who are marginalized are also seeing those disparate impacts in terms of justice and how that plays out. And so I'll just leave that there. And I don't, I know that Kim Luders Demont also had a question, but I think he's on the phone, but he wanted to make sure that he was uh, included. I don't know how he is, but uh, included. I don't know how to do this technology. Thanks, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, no. I'm waiting. I'm, I'm with, with waiting for my wife who's getting out of spinning class here in Montpelier. My dog's in the car, so if he if he barks, please forgive me. Um, no problem. Uh, so, so yeah, thanks for the, the presentation, and and yeah, I'd love to, um, when I am in front of my computer later. I'd love to take a look at stuff. And so part of my work with the Department of State's attorneys prior to working as the legislative attorney was working as a deputy state's attorney, or in some of the states that you've worked in, an assistant district attorney. And I was assigned post-conviction relief cases for Washington County. Um, and so in, in Vermont, there's five pathways to appeal. There's the, and some of them would, you know, fall certainly well below the 10 year that you're talking about. But there's, of course, the 90 day reconsideration. Um, there's PCRs, which have no statute of limitations and um, which have certain criteria. Um, and then there's Supreme Court appeals and then both forms of habeas state and federal. And in the other states, is there any requirements that you have to <clears throat> like exhaust other remedies for appeal? Um, or like, is there anything, that's my first question about any of that stuff in other states, just because I haven't looked at it. And then the second part was just as a point of coming from the world that I just came from working on PCRs, um, post-conviction relief cases that I, recently in, in my work doing that came to two voluntary agreements that were, you know, um, stemmed from the filing of a PCR. But one I cited at the resentencing that the gentleman had was 20 years old at the time, was under the influence of a number of really difficult factors in his life, including substance use disorder that was mostly stemming from multi-generational issues um, from his mom and, and other folks in his life. And it was it was effectively second, you know, a second look, right? And th the things that had been brought to the table um, as for the basis for the PCR were important, right? But when we actually talked about, let's resentence this person, um, there was some important things there, obviously letting the victims know after it was, he'd been in, in for eight years. And I have to tell you, you know, this group that it was one of the most uh, emotional like days that I've had as a prosecutor. Um, seeing him wear his Red Sox hat out of the courtroom and Judge Morris, he spent time in this courtroom too, but it was, it was after her time. Um, and it was a wonderful moment, um, but it was, you know, allowed through a current remedy that we, that we have uh, that does drive for victims, you know, to have a, have a moment. And it was, it took some doing to let the victims know after eight years trying to find them. And then the, the second story was, is a more serious one, more in line with what the captain was talking about, but um, a person who was having severe health issues despite a very egregious crime to a three-year-old uh, sexual in nature. Um, we, I came to a difficult decision that I'm sure was unpopular amongst some prosecutors, but that um, due to the, his deteriorating health, um, despite that not being the reason for the PCR, uh, I wanted to release him with conditions into the community and um, I, again, I'm just showing as two examples of the current remedies in Vermont, how they're functioning. Um, not to say that they're happening th that way that way everywhere. They were two important cases for me that I wanted to share with this group, um, but also with you in terms of the current landscape. And my wife just got in the car from spinning, so that's what's happening. Um, yeah. But I, and so anyway, I just wanted to share that. I, and I know it's mostly commentary um, because I appreciate what you're doing and the work you're doing across the country, because clearly, there is national uh, issues, and Vermont's not immune from them. Um, I, believe me, that is so true. And there was another PCR recently in, in Washington County where there was a clear issue of racial bias that took place at the time, and it was disclosed years later. So uh, the state of Vermont happily stipulated to release of that person. Um, so there's, a, there's the last thing I'll mention to the group while I've got the, the floor 
is that updating the PCR, and this is not coming from the 14 elected state's attorneys, but as a point of discussion, updating the PCR statute, um, if you want to expressly provide for racial bias, I mean, there's certain ways to, I think, use our existing remedies um, effectively. And they're not, nothing is the simple, as we know in this story, nothing is the simple solution. Um, everything takes little bits and pieces here and there. But I, I wanted to offer that out there to the group. I know it's a lot to, to digest and sorry for talking for a while. No, thank you for sharing that. I mean, like a couple of things to point out. Second look is the best of research in terms of remedies that, you know, all of the criminologists and everyone who, who's worked on this for decades could come up with for a couple of different reasons. A lot of states have done a lot of tweakings to a lot of sections of law. What we know is that proving racial bias mm. is almost impossible mm -hmm. in most cases. And so what we asked in this, I mean, so we thought about like all of these things, but then you get to the actual practice of law and it's like, okay, well, how am I actually going to prove 30 years later that that person was racist? It's going to be almost impossible to do. And so what we did was turn this into a positive as opposed to focusing on all the negatives. Okay, this person has been incarcerated for a significant amount of time. Let's take a look at the difference as to who they are now. Let's take a look at the rehabilitation. Let's take a look at everything that they've done to decide if punishment should be continued because we know the recidivism rates for lifers. That's been established. It's been established in every state, including Vermont, that um, there is a disproportionality when it comes to race and sentencing. It's been proven everywhere about the impact of gender and sentencing. You know, these are all sort of established criminological facts, but what could we actually do in a law that would be broad enough to give everybody a chance and have it be focused on something that is provable in a court of law? And rehabilitation is a lot easier to prove. And yes, take into, take into account all of the other factors, right? I mean, all of those things need to be taken into account. But the fact of the matter is just in terms of data, and yes, I do think Vermont has done a lot of great work, but since 2003, you've doubled your population of those serving life sentences, even though your overall carceral population has gone down. And that's something, you know, to to flag. Um, uh, I, I can't I think it was Witchy, I believe you had your hand first up and I believe it was Judge Morrissey and then Reverend Mark. Yep. Yeah, um, thank you. Uh, I love being in these because I always learn so much. And so just really appreciating for everything everyone is is putting into the space. Um, there are two things that I think was brought up to, to me um, that's worth acknowledging. Maybe it's more of a common less of questions. One, um, you know, noting that, yes, that we have uh, a less, uh, like a lower population than, the re than other states. We also have less resources and less capacity. Um, so it's worth noting for us in RDEP as we, you know, prepare our report um, you know, to look through this bill, what are ways that we're creating bottlenecks and how can we preempt those bottlenecks to make sure that, for example, someone who, like in the 90 day, it's like, well, then that requires lawyers and that requires this and that requires that. And it's just like, well, the 90 days already passed, right? Mm -hmm. So making sure that we're thinking about ways that this can be efficient for those who are going to apply. Um, and for the resources that we need to put in as a state to make sure they're taken care of. Um, and the, the second thing was, um, you know, to, to this point of the different ways, different pathways that we have, it might be worth noting that as we talk about second look, we, we, we make it sort of like a, a very um, explicit comparison of what, what the second look offer that the others don't. And why is this a solution? And make it because these questions are going to be asked of the legislature, and it's important that it doesn't sort of get swiped away like we've seen with other bills. Um, so just just those two that sort of are coming to my mind that is worth just making sort of those those thoughts in the minutes. Thanks. Well, eligibility numbers is always the the number the number one thing, and that you know this is something that the state tells you you're eligible for, as opposed to you having to figure it out. Um, because figuring out resentencing from prison is um, if you don't have the money for legal help, 
is difficult. Um, Judge Morrissey, um, you're you're muted, ma'am. I can't I can't hear you. Sorry about that. Um, the uh, and I also appreciate all the work you do, and I really appreciate you being here tonight. The in other states, is it the sentence itself that triggers the second look? Is there any consideration given to the fact whether or not it was a plea agreement? The vast majority of people serving time in Vermont is the result of plea agreements where they have agreed to a certain amount of time. And oftentimes there's consideration given by the state at the outset for that agreement. And if it's, are the, are the other states looking at it just if it was a contested sentencing where there was actually discretion by the court? Or is it, if somebody's agreed to that sentence as being appropriate, they still qualify for the second look? So no other state even think is thinking of it in that way. The way that they're thinking of it is after you've served a certain amount of time, you're eligible. They are not um, getting into the weeds on uh, plea agreements because actually one of the major arguments around second look in, in across the country and the reason that a lot of actually like DAs and defense attorneys um, have stepped forward is to say that, you know, I've been in situations where the choice for my client was almost all of their life or all of their life. Mm -hmm. And so, and, you know, and they were being over sentenced, but I don't have the resources to fight that. Um, you know, or depending on the state, it's a capital case, right? So it's a case of, you know, they're going to get pumped full of potassium chloride or they're going to get life without the possibility of parole. And those are my options. Um, and so they take life without the possibility of parole. There are a lot of arguments that have been put forth by um, even like fair and just prosecution um, talking about plea agreements and why second look is actually necessary as to who gets offered what. And all of this is the argument to simply say, after you've served an extensive period of time, you are eligible to apply. You are not necessarily granted, but you are eligible to apply. And that based on all of the research and all the conversations we've had across the country is the best and cleanest way to do it. Mm -hmm. to actually address mass incarceration um, and to go back and review cases um, and to do it at a point where we know from the criminological curve where people are usually going to start to show differences in behavior uh, we, and reduced uh, criminality, so on and so forth. So all of this research came together with these recommendations, which is what we have served as the basis for all of the bills that we have worked on across the country. If you actually look at the language of most of the bills, you'll see they all look very similar. They're obviously retrofitted for that state's particular code, but they all look very similar because it basically is, is the best in show. And are they, and I know other people have questions, so I'm not going to um, dominate your time here, but the are they all based on the 10 year generally, or is it based on a percentage of the sentence that they've served? Or is it just that everybody gets it at 10 years or so, whether it's a 10 year sentence or a 35 year sentence? So New York state has done 10 year or 50% of sentence if you've been sentenced to more than five years, which is the same replication that we've done for this bill for Vermont. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right, thank you. Um, based on prison populations. Um, Michigan, we had to tier it out with the eldest and the sickest going first, simply because their prison population is so large. Um, but that's not uh, as serious an issue in Vermont. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Reverend Mark? Or should I call you Reverend Hughes? <laughs> you can call me Mark. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, Alexandra, um, thank you for coming. And also, um, you know, it's clear that you've, you know, that you're, you know, a rock star and in some of the stuff that you're doing. I'm sure everybody else is impressed too. I, I wanted to just say that, um, you know, the Citizens Project is, is really at the heart and soul of is this very, uh, this very board, this very um, uh, group of folks here, because uh, when we 
um, a lot of the research, and I'll just put something up in the chat, a lot of the research that was done back in 2016, you, you know, you probably know Ashley Nellis, uh, a lot of this Very stuff. Very well. <laughs> you know, it, it really was, you know, it was really looking at just what sad shape Vermont was in at that time. So I, that's why I appreciate your presence. I, I, I also would note that the, this panel was was uh, constituted originally uh, with the um, with the hope that it would be more oversight oriented and it would be focused on racial disparities in the criminal and juvenile justice system advisory pa panel, as it um, right rightfully is named. But we 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 wanted to call it oversight. They um, pulled that back from us and said, "No, you're actually advisory." and your panel. We want it to be a commission. We want it to be independent, all that other stuff. So just the kind of background, and the reason why I said uh, that is, is that where I'm taking you is, is that, um, you know, clearly the focus of this uh, panel uh, has always been, you know, what do we do about the disparities in the system? Uh, and uh, that's why I said bingo uh, when um, I think it was Jennifer or somebody had said, hey, what about the disparities? It's just it's kind of like in I don't I don't know that I have a question and and folks on this call know that I could talk for a while which I won't um, but the thing is is that um, you know the same thing happened when we started to introduce diversion programs and I think probably Aaron you're probably more familiar with some of this stuff than me on the call but we started introducing programs that maybe um, I don't know Elizabeth you probably are, have some insight into some of this too but you know, we introduced these programs for, you know, restorative justice or for trans, tra uh, trans uh, transformative justice or whatever you want to call it. Um, but then those same disparities manifest themselves in the new, uh, as you know, the, the new component, the new aspect in, in terms of the way that we're doing things. So, yeah, I would just, you know, I think there is like one little question. This is just, um, are you hearing this in, in other places? Um, uh, and uh, I just would like to follow up on that. The vast majority of second look recipients are black. That's all. That's all I can tell you. Yeah. Um, and also, the thing about second look that's very concrete, unlike a lot of programs where you're tracking outcomes, right? Which, you know, <clears throat> you track a lot of different metrics. Mm -hmm. Second look, the first metric you track is freedom, which right. is pretty darn concrete and a massive difference to community. That's returning fathers, that's returning mothers, that's returning siblings. You know, that's putting black families, families in general, back together. Um, and so that in and of itself is the concrete thing that I have actively seen from Second Look. Um, because the fellow who sits in my office, who I supervise is a Second Look recipient. Warren Allen, he's on our website. Um, wow. I've sat through second look hearings. Um, the vast, I mean, because the vast majority of the prison population is black, it's almost hard for the vast amount of the beneficiaries not also to be black or brown. When, se you know, there are states where 70% of the population is black and brown. So it's almost hard to, to do it otherwise. And in a state like Vermont, it would become painfully obvious very quickly into these resentencings if there was that disparity happening. It would be so easy to actually track and pinpoint, which is actually what makes Second Look, at least for me as a total data geek, particularly exciting. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. And I, I would just say that, you know, here in Vermont, you know, when, when we're doing horrible, uh, we've we've got about a 10 or 11 percent incarceration rate for black folks. I think we're somewhere hovering around nine or 10. You probably would know better than me right now. Uh, 10.8 are black, 3.4 are other. You have 1% that's Native and Asian, 1.6 that's more than one race for a total of 16.8 that represent right. not white. Right, so you would know that um, the the it's about 94.5% white in the state. So that's just, uh, those are ugly numbers. Yeah. Uh, but clearly the vast majority of our prison is white folks. Uh, so that, that's that's the difference between Vermont and the other states. And I'm not trying to um, th throw a curveball at you, uh, but it it is it's horrible. The numbers are horrible. And, you know, we can talk about private prisons in Mississippi if you want to as well. But the thing is, is that there's, you know, there it's a different dynamic here as far as the demographics 
and it's it's harder to lift to to rise all of the ships with uh with that tide here um and and i understand the approach it seems good uh it seems like it would work in in many other places and it probably would work here i don't know probably would but i but i do understand the rationale because it's an indirect approach to get something done which is what we have to do uh when we're trying to go after um leveling the playing field for black for black folks if for no other reason than the weaponization of the 14th Amendment. Um, but we won't talk about that tonight anyway. Um, so well, thank you I for mean, coming. I appreciate you. It's my pleasure. I mean, 1.5% of Vermont is Black. 10.8% of, of the prison population is Black. That in a different in a different population, the terrible thing that I always point out to a lot of states is that actually, although you have different demographics per capita, you actually track some of the worst states in the country, which is, you know, a terrible thing to, to say. Um, could you pronounce your name for me? I'm so sorry. Is it Ting? Yes, Ting. Ting, thank you. Hi, Alex. Uh, thank you for sharing your knowledge and the experience. Really appreciate it. I, I have two questions. And the first one is about the financial cost of um, reviewing the, the second look cases. I wonder if other states' um, bills or uh, laws address this and establish funding for reviewing the costs. I know a um, lot of states charge a fee to apply for a second look case. Um, that obviously is a financial um, barrier for a lot of applicants. And uh, does that cover the cost or is there a way to establish um, funding for, for reviewing the cases? And the second one is legal support. Um, if I remember this information correctly, uh, or I got the information correctly, I think in DC, um, there is an effort to pair the second look um, applicants with pro bono legal teams so they can get mm -hmm. support that they need to, to apply for these cases. Um, is that a common practice in other states? And how do we ensure that the applicants get access to uh, the, the, the legal or the, uh, the legal support that they, they need so, they, so the, you know, the disparity doesn't get replicated in the process? I'm so glad you asked that question. This is exactly why the Second Look Network, which is an attorney network, has been mounted at the sentencing project for that very reason, to ensure equal legal representation across the board, to address the disparity of the very fact that people whose families can afford lawyers to help them apply for this are probably going to do very differently than people who cannot. Now, states have handled this differently, um, depending on the size of their carceral population and their financial sort of wherewithal. I have states where we've written bills that they are entitled to representation from the application phase from the public defender service, who will be given um, a price per case, uh, much the way they do with regular cases. In some states, um, they are not able to provide that. And so a, per so a person can either go pro se, meaning they represent themselves essentially, or they are able to hire an attorney or the judge can appoint an attorney in cases where the judge deems that is necessary. All of these things currently exist. In Washington, DC, we've actually set up whole nonprofits of lawyers that do nothing but second look cases. Um, but part of the reason we set up our second look legal network is to ensure that when we pass these bills, the legal representation is there through one of those various sources. Okay. Um, Alex, just so you know, um, Susanna Davis put into the chat, um, which states are those that give representation from the application stage? So uh, the state of New Hampshire's bill, um, their public defenders asked for representation to represent from the application stage. Um, that's actively what they asked for. So that's what we wrote. Um, and so that's the bill that they're currently considering, which is sort of the most aggressive that I've seen in terms of actual representation. Most other states 
can be adopted by the defender services after people apply, hire an attorney, go pro bono, or do pro se. Um, and that's how most states read. But in a lot of states, the defender service is, is very frequently so non-existent that they couldn't possibly take it on even if they had wanted to. Okay. Well, okay, Rebecca, you've got the last word because we've got 30 seconds. <laughs> Sorry for going over. Not a problem. Rebecca? We can't hear you. Got it. I just unmuted. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for letting me have the last word. Uh, Alex, Rashana, thank you so much. My goodness, I'm joining everyone else's appreciation for, for your insight. I think at this stage, the question is what's next? Uh, as, as sort of the chair of the subcommittee on second look, um, I know that others have expressed we just got uh, a link to the proposed language here tonight. I wonder if it makes sense for um, for the committee to meet or maybe members here tonight who have follow-up questions uh, to for, for this language to, to send them in. Um, Alex, Roshana, do you have any uh, in terms of your availability for us to reach back to you with um, further thoughts, questions? Um, can you just confirm? Yes, <laughs> I mean, um, you are going I knew I threw a lot of information at you and um, there's a lot to get into the weeds on, on this bill. But like I said, this is a bill that serves as sort of best in show of everything we know from across the country when it comes to resentencing of how we're really going to take carceral numbers down. So I'm available for questions. I will be putting together more research for Vermont, which I will share. I'm always available by email or phone, and I'm happy to return either to this meeting or a subcommittee meeting or to one-on-one -on -one meetings as people need. I will throw my email in the chat. Oh, yay. So feel free to reach out with questions. And this is my cell phone number if you need to get a hold of me quickly. Great. Alex, thank you so much. Thank you so very, very much. Thank you so much for allowing me to come and for potentially um, you know, adopting um, a, a bill like this um, for, for your state and, and for the fact that you guys are just doing so much in general to address all of these types of concerns. Great, thank you. Just wanna give my thank you too. I'm so sorry I had to go off video. My uh, Zoom started to act up. Thank you so much everybody for all your questions and the conversation tonight. It was really amazing to be with you all. Thank you. Okay, um, just to round things out, um, again, I would echo everybody else. Thank you all for all of this. Um, is there any new business that anyone needs to bring up now? Or are we all sort of sitting and cogitating? <laughs> I'm I'm sorry to drag this out, but I do have the numbers for the the, the reports, the community safety reviews. Oh, okay. Go ahead. Maybe I can just give them and then we can follow up with email on sure. so uh Bradaboro, which did a research on my um like focus studies with marginalized folks and community safety um, is 224. Um, the Brattleboro Union High School did um, an SRO research and that's 24 pages. Um, uh, Amherst, Massachusetts did a research on safety in communities and with Brattleboro, so that's 68 pages. Um, and Burlington did a uh, review of the police department and that's 172 pages. Okay, thank you. Judge Morrissey, I hope that helps. Yes, it did. I mean, so that sounds like about 600 pages worth of reading, five to 600. Yep. Yeah. So I think that gives us all a sense of the, the time commitment that's being requested. Right. Does everyone need to read all of them where each person could take on one? That's that's up to the subcommittee to decide. Yeah, I think that that means that I think there needs to be a meeting of everyone who might be interested in doing this and at least 
have a conversation and an informational session and then go from there. And then we can see who's actually going to be able to do this work. Uh, I'm interested in helping and yeah. Um, okay. I, yeah, need want to know a little bit more about what's involved, but yeah, I'm pretty good at reading reports. <laughs> <laughs> So, <laughs> excuse me. So, Witchy, you and I should talk soon. Yes, um, and please email Aton and or me if, if you want to help make this happen. Right. Okay. Thank you. Next meeting is Valentine's Day. I like the, that's just charming to me. Um, 14th of February. Um, uh, can shall we stop shall we close the meeting and if so anton yes i was just going to say if it's between you and my wife i'm probably going to spend it with my wife not not just saying you're not pretty but i'm just saying you know just saying it's over it's <laughs> over chief it's just over so i'm just saying um, <laughs> so does anyone want to make a motion here at this moment Eight o'clock, a little past. Yeah, I'll make a motion to end the meeting at 8.05. All right. Anyone seconding? I'll second. Can we put in the chat then, if there's no discussion about that, our vote for those of us who are in favor of adjourning? Okay. Bye, Mark. Um, all opposed, please put that in the chat. All abstaining. The eyes have it. See you all in February, but we'll be in touch before then. Thank you so very much.